again, Emma Hauser. Um, I represent the UW Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility with Tyler that just presented, as well as Wisconsin Sea Grant for Aquaculture Outreach and Education. So this presentation is more honing in on our larval system. So why it's built the way it is, really looking at the biology of the fish itself. Um, I put a couple things in the chat. One, our walleye culture guide. Um, this is publicly available guide. It's meant to be kind of a technician hatchery guide. So it's really easy to read, really just talking about our successes and, and how we raise walleye um, from egg all the way up into market size and then even brood stock. So please check that out. Um, we also have a video manual, which is 10 different videos, just basically showing you how we are spawning our fish, um, raising them in the culture system. So even though this presentation won't go into details, you can find those details in those resources. And then, of course, the Walleye Culture Manual, um, published in 96 by Bob Sommerfeld and a bunch of other authors, was the Bible of walleye culture. So that is publicly available at the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center site. I will pop that in the chat as well. But um, really, a lot of our basic understanding of walleye culture has come from this guide. So um, Bob Sommerfeld was definitely kind of the, the man uh, for, for walleye culture. So we still go back to this book. Um, for a lot of our research and, and procedures. So if you're raising walleye, you really have to understand the biology of this fish. So just taking a minute to talk about, you know, what is this fish like at the larval stages? Um, catching up to where Tyler just ended off here is, is photopositive behavior um, when they hatch out of the, bar the larval systems. And I'm actually gonna stop my video here so that um, this plays a little better. So, you can see that they're all concentrating near this light source. So they are photopositive, meaning they're attracted to light or light colored objects when they're young. This is how we can collect strong swimming fry. So we aren't concentrating on the fry that are laying on the bottom or not near this light source. We're scooping them up from this area right by the light. We're putting them through a larval counter, um, which counts individual fries. That's a gen sorter larval counter. Um, and then we can have a very more an exact number when we are stocking either our ponds for extensive rearing or indoors in our larval tanks. So walleye develop very quickly. When they first hatch out, they barely even look like a fish. They have no mouth part even. You can kind of see their eyes and their yolk sac. But in several days, they'll be able to kind of open their mouths here. You can even see teeth are developing at this point. Um, they're, they're absorbing that yolk sac. And then depending on your water temperature, in three to five days, they're ready to feed. Um, so that's very quickly compared to our salmonid fish, right? So again, depending on water temperature, um, you know, you wouldn't wait more than a week to start feeding these fish. And the minute that they can feed on an external food source, they can look to each other for food. So cannibalism really starts at the onset of exogenous feeding. So these fish are about 12 days old at this point. And you notice they are much, there's not much size difference between them. So they will cannibalize um, their siblings. And so this is a major issue for species like bass and, and walleye. Um, they have a very large mouth gape. So we're gonna talk about ways that we limit this behavior, um, but understand that it still happens. And it's very hard to catch, you know, how much is this happening in your tank? Even fish that maybe were cannibalized and then spit out and you count that as a mortality, it's hard to know, you know, what was, you know, what was the cause of that mortality? Was it cannibalized or did it simply just die? So cannibalism is a, a major issue that we, that we still see with our walleye. So a couple of key points for initial survival of this species is for one, you have to make sure that they're gonna accept the feed that you give them. Um, we give them otohimi from day one um, to exogenous feeding. I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the second thing is gas bladder inflation or air bladder inflation, which is this here. The gas bladder in persids like walleye, perch, have to physically be inflated by the fish. So sometimes in salmonid species, they can do it through their blood. Uh, for persids, they have to physically come up to the surface and kind of swallow um, a gulp of air and inflate that physically themselves. There's only a window of time to do this. So that's about five to 12 days, again, depending on development, post-hatch, this happens. So if they aren't able to inflate it during that interval, they can know no longer inflate it. So that fish will not have a gas bladder um, throughout its entire life. Um, this becomes an issue when you have species that are cannibalistic because without a gas bladder, 
you have a poor swimming ability, slower growth, and be subject to cannibalism. So looking back at this picture, the one that is being cannibalized has does not have a gas bladder or has not inflated it yet. So I'm gonna talk about um, one of the techniques we use to make sure that this happens or at least um, allow it to happen a little more easily. So this is our larval system. We've been raising walleye intensively indoors like this for about 15 years at the facility. Um, this specific system is really built with all those key points I just mentioned in mind. So they're specific, this is completely specific to walleye. Um, it's utilized for feed training. So we never start on live feeds. We start with otohimi, which is a Japanese diet, um, and then get them converted over into more of a commercially available grow out diet like spreading. So that's the idea for this room. Um, it takes about eight to 10 man hours daily for about 30 to 40 days. So this system, we have 27 larval tanks. They're about 60 gallons in size. Um, these are small and replicated because we're research. So there is other kind of commercially larger tanks that are self-cleaning. Um, so there's different designs of these systems. This is just an example of ours. Um, we've looked at different densities for stocking. Um, we've looked at everything, anything from five to 21 fry per liter, which is about 20 to 83 fry per gallon. Um, the the kind of lower the densities we've had better luck with just because you are you, these tanks are only so big, so you're feeding these fish a lot of feed. So once we start looking at higher densities in these, it's just a lot of feed being poured to these tanks, um, and sometimes it's not as efficient. So we're kind of looking at the lower end, so that's what I would suggest if you are doing this, start with the low density and then you know see what your system can handle and what you can handle. Um, the system is flow through, so we aren't worried about buildup of ammonia so much or nitrite or nitrate. Um, we are looking at 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. We want nearly 100% oxygen for these fish. We don't want them to be working at all um, to get oxygen. So um, try to keep that as close to 100% as we can with a seven to eight pH. There are some of our partners and other facilities that are starting to recirculate this water, uh, but we have found that there might be some issues with deformities and also we have turbid water here that I'll talk about in a second, which is an extra challenge for trying to recirculate that. And again, a lot of these topics came from that Wiley Culture Manual by Summerfeld. So I'm gonna just run through the key points of how we raise walleye at this larval stage. Again, it's, there's a lot more detail in our guides and our video manual, uh, but the basics of this system is for one, like I mentioned, turbid water. We use a very specific clay to create a turbidity of 50 to 80 NTUs in the system. And again, it's flow through. Um, so we're constantly managing for that 50 to 80 um, NTUs. We have black tank sides and a gray bottom, and that works with the turbidity to really help disperse the fry throughout the water column. Um, again, when they first are put in here, they're photopositive. So any reflection of light or light colored tank um, they would do a clinging behavior, cling to the side of the tank and not look for food. So it's really important to help them disperse with kind of having a, a lighter bottom, dark sides, and then it's working with that turbidity. We wanna be feeding these fish consistently. So these are 24 hour feeders that are dropping in otohimi to start. So we've started with both a B1 and a B2 size. Um, we've kind of been experimenting with both of those size. And then by the time 40 days or 30 to 40 days, we're transitioning them to spreading Europa is what we've had the most luck with. Um, that's about a 1.2 millimeter. So by the time they're out of the system, they should be on that Europa. A spray bar is crucial uh, to inflate gas bladder. So as I mentioned, they have to physically take a gulp of air. You have to have something that is breaking the tension of the water. So when we say spray bar, it's basically like a hydroponic sprayer um, and it's spraying the surface of the water and it's doing a couple of different things. It's breaking that surface tension of the water so that they can come up and, and, and break that themselves. Um, but also it's keeping the tank clean. So this feed is very oily and it can float on the surface of the water. So without a spray bar, it creates a very kind of a film surface on our tanks. And so looking at this, from both walleye and this was actually a perch project we did. Um, the spray bar, we had over 90% inflation of, of gas bladders. Without that spray bar, we had very poor. So it's a very obvious um, need that, that these fish need some sort of uh, breaking of that tension of that water and a spray bar works really well for us. 
rotational inflow is really important. Um, that helps, of course, keep water quality consistent, but also helps to orient the fish in one direction. So if the fish are sort of haphazardly swimming around the tank, um, they're kind of looking for prey. So um, it does help when they're oriented in one direction, limit that cannibalistic behavior. Um, and it also helps kind of move the feed around. And how we do that initially is just with a pipe here, a PVC pipe with holes drilled down the side um, with a cap. So we're just kind of pushing that water, but it's really important to manage this. We want good flow, right? We want the ex tank exchange to be at least two exchanges an hour, but we don't want to spin the fish too hard. We want just enough to get them to orient. If you're spinning walleye too hard, meaning more than one body length per second, um, you get issues with fin quality um, and they're just using a lot of their energy and reserves. So you want just enough to get them to orient. We have a center screen with a center screen pipe and an external screen pipe or sta sorry, stand pipe <laughs> um, when they start out. So this is what that screen looks like. It's got a lot of surface area to let water uh, flow out. Um, and then when they're very young, we start with this internal stand pipe because we don't want a lot of bottom suction when they're really young. Um, so we have two of them here and it helps kind of regulate the water level. Once they're about a week old, we can remove this, this kind of center stand pipe and just have the external. So we have a little bit more bottom pull of that water. Um, and I can explain that a little bit better if anybody needs to. Um, but this is what the screens look like. So the sooner we can bump up screen size, the better. So we start with a really fine micron, uh, 400 micron screen. Um, in about a week or two, we, we move to the 1,000 micron. And then by the time 30 days is here, um, we end with a two millimeter. So of course, we want to keep the fry inside the tank, but then we want to be able to bump up as quick as possible to really help the water quality in that tank. Last thing is, is dimmable lighting. So we have overhead lights on, on each of our tanks or, or a pair of tanks that we can dim down. So um, the original picture you saw was very dark. They like it very dim um, the entire time in this, in this system. The only time that we would kind of turn those lights up is if they are photopositive and we are cleaning. So this is a little video of photopositive fry. So we have the lights kind of turned up. And the reason we have them turned up is so that we can clean underneath those fry. So we siphon the bottom of these tanks every day and we wanna be able to, to lift them up off the bottom and clean underneath them. After about 12 to 15 days, these fish will become photo negative. So you go up to a tank, they dive down. That means we have to clean in the dark it's because when we turn the lights up at that point, they'll actually dive down and we don't want that. So again, it's kind of keeping tabs on the age of these fish, what they're doing. Um, some of the challenges is all of these factors that I just talked about kind of overlapping and determining either success or, or not. Um, this chart is available on that culture guide that I put in the chat. It's kind of our base and what we go off of every year, but it is flexible and we do kind of change it based on how they're doing. But there's all these continual adjustments that you have to make sure you're on top of. Uh, feed rates, feed sizes, the screen size, the flow rate, um, and velocity in that tank, turbidity levels, cleaning regime, and your lighting. So all of these things, there's so many factors that can influence how your fish do in this system. So we're constantly kind of tweaking this or updating this or looking at different uh, ratios and screen sizes and size of the fish. So um, again, it's a great base of knowledge, but you really have to kind of get the experience on your own as well and figure out how the fish are doing in your own system, in your own facility. Another challenge is some inconsistency. So we see anywhere from 30 to 70% survival. Um, sometimes this is based on the strain or the year. Sometimes it's based on um, our technicians, if they're new, if we're training them, but still that's, that's a serious kind of change in survival rates. So we're trying to hone in on some of those specifics. Um, but again, there's so many factors involved. The good thing is, is that once they are out of that system, their survival is pretty good, right? So um, when they're extended fingerling, uh, they're probably 90% survival. And there's a high market for these fish. As long as you know you keep your, their densities low, especially when they're a small fingerling, once they're extended fingerling, you can push them up to 30 or even 60 kilograms per cubic meter. 
but really velocity is super important. Keep that spin in the tank enough so they orient, but not too much. Um, don't spin them too hard. And of course, water quality is crucial for these fish. So quick summary here. We got to really remember the biology of walleye, really what they need. There's continual advancements for intensive systems, such as um, looking at new feeds and management equipment of these larval tanks and maybe improved strains. Um, and again, there's a base of knowledge available, but you really have to kind of get the experience and, and individual facilities will vary.